Big Brother, Thought Police, Doublethink, Orwellian. These words are all either associated with or coined by the writer George Orwell. But how did he become the man who would one day write some of the most important works of 20th century literature that would influence political debate still to this day? This is the story of a man who slowly built a career out of anti-totalitarianism and anti-fascism. Welcome to another World War II in Real Time Biography Special, where I take a closer look at the major or interesting figures of the war. I'm Indy Nidell. George Orwell is born Eric Arthur Blair on June 25th, 1903 in Motihari in the eastern state of Bihar, British India. Although he hails from a prestigious upper middle class family, it is one that has run out of money, and his father works as a minor official in the Indian civil service. Young Eric, while still very young, returns to England with his mother, where he attends an austere boarding school in Sussex. He does not much like his old-fashioned education. Still, it does inspire in him a particular skill, a knack for writing. This helps him get a scholarship to the prestigious Wellington College, and then to the even more prestigious Eton College. He publishes his first essays and poems while still a schoolboy and dreams of becoming a writer. He also develops a strong sense of English patriotism and a romantic affection for the mighty British Empire. At the age of 19, his parents send him to British Burma to join the Imperial Police. Blair serves there in a whole variety of postings throughout the colony. And he also witnesses firsthand the darker side of British imperialism. Harsh treatment, violence, and even executions are pretty standard methods of controlling colonial subjects, especially in times when nationalist movements are on the rise. Have a look at our Between Two Wars video on the interwar British Empire if you want more details about this. He will later regret his posting in Burma, and his works Burmese Days, A Hanging, and Shooting an Elephant all have strongly anti-imperialist messages. So. During leave in England in 1927, Blair decides not to return to the Imperial Police and instead will pursue his dreams of being a writer. But this is somewhat tricky when he has little income with which to support himself. He lives in poverty in Paris while trying to make it as a writer, supporting himself in jobs ranging from a restaurant dishwasher to private tutor. He also spends several months roaming London as a tramp. But this is apparently not born entirely of necessity. He will write in his 1937 book, The Road to Wigan Pier, I felt that I had got to escape not merely from imperialism, but from every form of man's dominion over man. I wanted to submerge myself, to get down among the oppressed, to be one of them and on their side against their tyrants. Whether Blair is exaggerating or his slumming is really ideologically driven, we do not know. But we do know one thing. He has developed a strong sense of solidarity for the destitute and downtrodden, and disdain for the system which creates them. Politics aside, come 1933, Blair can officially call himself a professional writer. He is ready to publish his first book, Down and Out in Paris and London, based on his experiences in those cities. He doesn't want his family to find out how he actually lived, though, so he thinks up a pseudonym. It's only meant to be a professional pen name, but it sticks. Eric Blair will slowly become George Orwell. Down and Out in Paris and London is a minor success, and Orwell publishes three novels over the next three years. All have modest releases, and they fail to propel Orwell to fame, but they are important in shaping his politics. He increasingly sees socialism as the answer to colonialism, totalitarianism, and poverty he has witnessed so far in his life. This will crystallize even more in 1936 when the Spanish Civil War begins. Like so many young idealists at the time, Orwell sees it as simply a fight between fascism and freedom, and decides to join the Republicans in the fight against Francisco Franco's nationalists. He arrives in Barcelona in a complicated political situation. He joins the brigades of the United Marxist Workers' Party, the POUM, working closely with the Independent Labour Party back in Britain. However, Stalinists, supported by the Soviet Union, are slowly becoming the dominating influence on the Republican side. This disillusions Orwell, who feels that the autocratic communism they profess negates the very cause for which he is fighting, 
These feelings are not helped by the factionalism which frequently paralyzes the Republican movement. He's also disappointed when posted to the relatively quiet Aragon front in northern Spain. But it is there that he meets many like-minded people. They are all inspired by socialist ideals and denounce Joseph Stalin as an oppressive tyrant. Orwell is also happily surprised at how democratic and non-hierarchical his regiment is. Orders are given, but only for a reason, not just to test blind obedience. It is in Aragon that Orwell truly comes around to the cause of democratic socialism. In a letter to an old school friend, he writes, I have seen wonderful things and at last really believe in socialism, which I never did before. It is though also there that he is shot in the neck by a sniper. Luckily, the bullet passes straight through him without hitting bone or artery and he survives. Less luckily, while he is recovering in the hospital, the POUM is outlawed by Stalinists and its members purged. Orwell is forced to lay low and soon returns to London, bitter about his short, lackluster service. In his 1938 book, Homage to Catalonia, he writes, I had promised myself to kill one fascist, and I had killed nobody yet. But he is about to witness a much bigger war against fascism break out, World War II. He is rejected by the army because of his wound and general poor health. However, he does join the Home Guard. When Germany invades the Soviet Union in June 1941, Orwell is surprised at how quickly the British people seem to drop their anti-Soviet sentiment. One could not have a better example of the moral and emotional shallowness of our time than the fact that we are now all more or less pro-Stalin. This disgusting murderer is temporarily on our side, and so the purges, etc., are suddenly forgotten. Orwell finally finds meaningful war work in August 1941 with the BBC's Eastern Service. He is responsible for cultural broadcasting in British India to counter Nazi propaganda in the region. He resigns from this position in 1943 after he realizes that few Indians actually listen to the broadcasts. Well, this is one reason why Orwell also wants to devote more time to a new novel. It is a short fable about farm animals that will eventually become one of the most influential books of the 20th century. The plot is simple. A group of farm animals rebel against their farmer and institute a society in which everyone is equal. However, certain pigs slowly take power and establish a dictatorship of violence and terror. Published in 1945, the book is called Animal Farm and it is an allegory for the rise of Stalinism in the Soviet Union. It is a huge success, and four years later, Orwell will release another novel named 1984 that will only gather more praise. These two novels propel him to stardom and cement his position as one of the most important writers of his century. Though he dies in 1950 at the age of just 46 after several years of fighting tuberculosis, his legacy will live on, influencing political debate on totalitarianism, democracy, and anti-fascism in all the years to come. If you'd like to learn more about the Spanish Civil War, what it was all about, the various factions and how it began, you can check out our first Between Two Wars episode about that right here. Um, before I tell you about subscribing and see you next time, I got something else to say. Now, many of you know that a guy named Johnny writes into every single one of our World War II episodes and all of our Time Goes History episodes and rates the various ties that I wear in these episodes between one and five. And he offers criticism and compliments about how the time matches the suit or the subject matter. We did thank him as a, as a member of the Time Ghost Army in one of our episodes, but it was in an episode of the Time Ghost series on the Indonesian War of Independence, and it was the only one in which I'm not wearing a tie. You'd think we would have actually caught that, but we didn't catch that. Um, but. You know, we're starting to auction off our ties at Indy's Tie Barn soon, but Yanni definitely deserves at least one tie for all of his support and all of his tie-related weirdness on all of our channels. So, um, what I'm thinking, Johnny, is that this tie, this tie is for you, right? We're giving this tie to you because this is just awesome. And you are too, all right? And for everyone else out there, do not forget to subscribe to never miss our content and read our comments to never miss any of Johnny's commentary 
on my ties. And our content on this channel now comes out three times a week, so you get plenty of Thai weirdness, all right? See you next time. Mm -hmm.